Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast brought to you by Third Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Rick Doblin, the founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. You know, so when Michael Mithover came to me, our, our lead psychiatrist in 2000, and I'd never met him before, and Michael came up to me and he said that he um, was a member of MAPS, he'd studied with Stan Groff and the whole trip of breath work, and he wanted to work with me on an offshore clinic. And I basically said, there are no private utopias. I'm not interested in that at all. What I want to do is go to the heart of the system and change from the inside out. And that means going through the FDA. Hey, listeners, I am absolutely thrilled to have Rick Doblin on the podcast today. Uh, Rick is a luminary in the psychedelic space. He's been at this for a very, very long time, since the mid-70s. Uh, Rick started MAPS in 1986 and has been pioneering the path for legally available psychedelic medicine. So today we talk about Rick's story and path coming into psychedelics. We discuss uh, some of the interesting financial models that MAPS has been experimented with, including regenerative financing. And then we just talk about the vision of a spiritualized humanity and what that might look like. Uh, Rick really needs no introduction. If you are listening to this podcast or have listened to it for a period of time, uh, you, you likely have heard of MAPS or know of Rick Doblin. Uh, he's a mensch, an incredible human, and it really is an honor to present this podcast uh, with Rick Doblin for today's episode. All right, that's it for now. Let's dive into this episode. I hope you enjoy uh, my conversation with Rick Doblin. Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast. Uh, today we have a very, very special guest, uh, Rick Doblin, who is the founder and executive director of MAPS. Rick, it's really an honor yeah. to have you for the podcast. Today. Yeah, I look forward to our conversation. As, as do I. So this is the third podcast. I just got done interviewing Hamilton Morris. Oh, good. Uh, so you're following Hamilton. We had a really interesting conversation with him about patents. Oh, and, oh, uh, I, you know, synthetics uh -huh. and some of the work that he's up to. So we might touch on a few of those things today, yeah. especially because the approach that you've taken through MAPS is quite novel in terms of a nonprofit yeah. bringing a pharmaceutical drug through market. However, before we get into all of that, many of our listeners, they know of you or they've heard a little bit about your story, but just to start with like a five minute life story of <laughs> oh, Rick Doblin. Okay. What, what is the five minute? Okay. Um, well, I would say that uh, 50 years ago, in um, 1972, when I was 18 years old, is when I decided to uh, devote my life to psychedelics, uh, meaning that I needed psychedelic therapy myself. <laughs> I wanted to become a psychedelic therapist, and I wanted to bring back psychedelic research. And since I just came off a panel about um, veterans and trauma and veterans, I'll share that um, as I grew up, I was kind of... Um, trained to be politically active by my parents. They were very left-wing, progressive kind of parents. And so I had a series of uh, three traumatic incidents, all secondary in the sense that I was um, born in 53, and so I was educated on stories of the Holocaust. That was made me realize the psychological factors, how people can dehumanize others and, and do things and, and cut themselves off from rationality and their emotions. Then was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and this idea that uh, we might blow up the whole world with the Russians. And I was in grade school and we're taught to duck under your desk, duck and cover, and it wasn't very reassuring. And then for me was the Vietnam. And what do I do about Vietnam? And I felt, uh, I studied a lot of nonviolent resistance and decided to be a draft resistor and go to jail right. as a way to protest. So, and then- How long uh, were you in jail for? Well, I never was in jail actually, oh, wow. because okay. um, what I, I'd never sent in the postcard to register, which was astonishing to me, because first off, I had a passport, I had a driver's license, I was paying taxes, I had a social security number, I was in high school, and you just assume they know you. But they make you voluntarily send in the postcard, and if you don't do that, that's the crime. And so I figured, of course, they're gonna come get me. Um, but this was before I started doing psychedelics. So then when I started doing psychedelics, um, I felt like that's the potential antidote to all these things. If we can feel connected to everybody and everything and to nature and feel that and know that, then we're going to be more tolerant of people that are different because mostly they're the same. And same with animals and nature and all of that. So to, to sort of give the arc of my life in a very short way was I identified as being a counterculture drug using criminal. So, so that's who I was. At, at age 18, I'm a counterculture drug using criminal. 
And I would say the last 50 years of my life have been to try to become a uh, culture instead of counterculture, to become legal instead of criminal, but remain a drug user or a medicine user or a psychedelic user or however we want Whatever to Whatever the about. term is, right? Yeah, so in the midst of that, I ended up getting a PhD and a master's from Harvard from the Kennedy School of Government, and I've studied psychotherapy with Stan Groff. So I've had two kind of trainings. One is to be a psychedelic therapist, and that's really to um, help individuals that are struggling with different things. And then the other has been public policy for sick public policies, you could say. So it's psychotherapy for sick public policies that require a lot more um, energy and people to try to change those factors. But it's not that different than thinking about individual psychotherapy on a cultural level. And so now we have um, the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, which is our pharmaceutical arm, and it's a, a way to innovate trying to bring drugs to market where you don't maximize profit, you maximize public benefit, and it's currently 100% owned by the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So that's our structure. We have 135 people working for the, uh, actually 150 people working for the wow. Benefit Corp and 35 people working for the nonprofit. Wow. So that's our structure. And just two days ago, we um, got the last data point in our second phase three study. So- And, it, and what, can you share? Well, well we, um, It'll take us about a month or and a half or so to analyze the data. But we believe based on the, so we did an interim analysis. So the interim analysis was done when it was 60% of the way done. And it said we had a over 90% probability of statistical significance. Um, so we think we're likely to get statistical significance. Um, the other key issue is safety. And there's acute side effects from MDMA, but they're not serious, they're transitory. And so the main safety issue is suicidality because that's a background factor for PTSD. That's why we hear about you know, 22 veterans a day committing suicide and, all, and others. So um, we don't have any um, serious adverse events. Um, as far as I know, in either group, the placebo group, meaning therapy without MDMA versus therapy with, M with MDMA. So I think we're gonna have a good safety profile and I think we'll have statistical significance, but that remains to be seen and we'll know before the end of the year. And if that's the case, what then happens with MDMA assisted psychotherapy? Then what we need to do is start preparing all these documents for submission to the FDA. For Now our phase three studies, again, this is, I think, um, because our long-term goal is mass mental health, the spiritualized humanity, we really need to think in a globalized way. So our phase three studies are done in Israel, United States, and Canada. Um, we are about two years behind going to Europe, but we are in Europe trying to train therapists for the European Medicines Agency so approval. 2026 maybe in, 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 in Europe. Europe? Yeah, okay. yeah, I would say they'll be two years behind. And then if you have FDA approval, most countries of the world will give reciprocity. Mm -hmm. If you have FDA and EMA approval, pretty much you get the whole world, wow. except for Russia, China, and Japan. Japan says that they're unique genetics, so they want to study you know, this very island. Japanese. <laughs> yeah. um, but then uh, Russia is super repressive. So even though in the 1990s, before psychedelic research in patients opened up in, in the rest of the world and in America, the only place where there was um, research going on with um, psychedelics in patients was in Russia, and it was ketamine for uh, substance abuse, alcoholism, and uh, opiate addiction. Oh, wow. And it was ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Yeah. And they were doing great. And then in the, uh, around the turn of the century, around 2000, ketamine became a little bit more of a uh, recreational drug in Russia, and so they shut down the research. So Russia is um, way behind, and China also is way behind. But Russia, China, Japan, other than that, pretty much everywhere in the world. We got, we got projects in, um, in Brazil, in Australia, um, seven countries in Europe, Israel, Canada, and United States. So we're it's happening. planning to globalize. Yeah. It's happening. How, so I'm curious, how has MAPS changed yeah. since Michael Pollan's publication of uh, How to Change Your Mind? Uh, okay. The, the well, structure, I'll, the organization, how, okay. just how yeah. has that impacted MAPS? Okay, well, um, so I was coming home from Burning Man. Yeah. This is one of the best stories. So I'm coming home from Burning Man, and um, I'm changing planes in, in Denver. Yeah. And this guy comes up to me and he says, I recognize you from this Netflix documentary. You're Rick Toplin. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm a psychiatrist at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. Wow. And can we bring MDMA there? Wow. 
I said, I'd love to work with you on that. I said, do you know that 10 years ago we tried at that same facility that you're at? And I learned this incredible lesson about uh, military hierarchy um, because um, the psychiatrist in charge of this facility wanted to do it, but he said he couldn't do it unless he had the permission of the admiral. All right, so then he gets the admiral's permission. The admiral says, well, I can't do it unless we get permission from my higher ups in the Pentagon. Sure. Um, we were working with Richard Rockefeller, who was the chair of the Board of Advisors of Doctors Without Borders. Mm -hmm. um, and he said um, he happened to know the Secretary of the Navy. So he talked to the Secretary of the Navy. The Secretary of the Navy says, fine, uh, but you got to come to the Pentagon and meet the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, the Navy Surgeon General, and all that. So then we have this meeting in the Pentagon, and that goes great. But then they say they're not high enough in the hierarchy. Um, we got to go up to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. Then we meet uh, their team. And they're saying, well, you got to get political support from the Senate. Now, Richard Rockefeller's um, cousin was Senator Jay Rockefeller on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. So he started intervening with us, both at the VA and the Department of Defense. Um, and in the end, this is now 2014, we were told to start with veterans. So the Michael Pollan's book has made it so I just have random people approach me and it turns out that they're incredibly important for different projects and to try to move us from just working with veterans to inside the DOD facility. So now we do have a project and um, in a few days on uh, Veterans Day, I'll be in San Diego and I'll be meeting with, with these people. To November 11 for, November the, 11. for the, for the Coronado. Coronado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll be there as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've got 11 o'clock meeting with the people, the guy that randomly contacted me at the Denver airport. So I think Michael Pollan's book and the documentary have changed a lot of people's minds and made it much more legitimate. Uh, but it's been difficult for Michael. So, you know, um, he and I just went for a long walk a few days ago because he's in Boston teaching um, science journalism at Harvard mm -hmm. uh, for the semester. Then he goes out back to Berkeley. But what he said was that being the food guy, he loved it, you know, because he's talking about um, recipes and food and gardening and, and all of this. And it was really delightful. But he says now that he's the psychedelic guy, it's very hard on him because he's inundated with human suffering. The, the people are constantly approaching him and saying, you know, this is my spouse or me or a relative and they're suffering and nothing's worked. How can you know, what can you do to help them? And he can't do anything. He's educated people, but he's not the therapist. And there's not a lot of above ground research as much as there needs to be. So, th so there was two media events that fundamentally changed cultural attitudes. One was Michael Pollan's book, um, and then the Netflix documentary. But before that was in 2003, and it was Peter Jennings. And, oh. and he did a documentary called Ecstasy Rising. Interesting. And it was the first documentary about ecstasy that ever had somebody saying something positive about it. And he challenged a lot of the claims about MDMA neurotoxicity. And he, his documentary came out right around the time that there was this project at Johns Hopkins that was terribly botched where they gave primates MDMA and they overdosed, a bunch of these primates died. But then they said that MDMA hurt dopamine and it could cause Parkinson's and they published this in Science, the premier scientific journal and didn't quite feel right. And um, we kept challenging it. And eventually they um, said that they tried to replicate their results for a year and they couldn't do it. And then they took one of the animals that they had overdosed and they analyzed brain tissue and found that they had given methamphetamine instead of MDMA. Pure methamphetamine. Pure methamphetamine yeah. instead of MDMA. They switched the bottles somehow. Um, so right around the time Peter Jennings' documentary came out was this was being exploded as well. So that was a massive cultural trans transformation. And that's right when we began the work with MDMA for PTSD. The phase one the, clinical trials. No, the starting to be phase two. Starting to be phase two. Yeah. So phase one is healthy volunteers. Right. And we did that through the 90s. Right. But um, I think Michael Pollan's book and, and Netflix documentary have had a similar massive cultural shift. So, you know, you mentioned how difficult it's been for Michael. It's also, I imagine, been very difficult for you. You know, you've been doing this yeah. for 37 years, yeah. you know, initially yeah. you were against the culture, you yeah, know, everyone yeah. probably saw you as a druggie and someone yeah. who was crazy. Yeah. Now that MAPS has reached a certain level of prominence, you're not only getting it from the non-psychedelic people, but you've also gotten a lot from certain psychedelic people. Mm. How, what keeps you grounded? What keeps you focused? What keeps you dedicated to this irrespective of all the- Well, just hearing the stories of healing and knowing that it works. So for example, um, 
I was just at the uh, conference in the Netherlands. ICPR. ICPR conference. It was terrific on psychedelics. And this woman comes up to me and she's crying. Um, and she's like, I just want to um, thank you um, because I was a subject in your study. And, and I had terrible PTSD. And then she held up her uh, hand and she had a ring and she said, and now I'm engaged and I'm starting my life again. And, and so just hearing from her, because the way the research is going, um, because of privacy, I don't know who the subjects are. And so there's so many uh, stories of healings that I never hear. So the fact that this woman would come to me and introduce herself, willing to be known, and then for me to hear that. Uh, so that's one of the things that keeps me going. The, the other is just a couple weeks ago, I got this um, email that was really tragic. And it was about, it was a picture of a tombstone and the tombstone had the MAPS logo on it. And, uh, and it had some sort of um, like um, stardust kind of on one side and the MAPS logo. And, and the story was that this was a Danish uh, military person <clears throat> who had P PTSD from Afghanistan. Some of the Danish army went to Afghanistan and he had come back with terrible PTSD. And while he was trying to search for solutions, he heard about MDMA therapy. And so he had two sessions of MDMA therapy in underground illegal contexts, and they helped him tremendously. And he started uh, getting his life back. He started losing weight. He started living again. But his therapist, who he was seeing, said that she would not be comfortable. She would not see him anymore if he did illegal things, that he had to give it up. And in order to get disability payments, from the Danish government, he also had to have her support and he couldn't be doing anything illegal, so he gave it up. And then he spent a couple years trying to do other therapies, because um, the two MDMA sessions had helped him a lot, but it hadn't solved all of his problems. We have a three session model with a lot of effort on integration a afterwards, and, afterwards. Yeah, and a lot of that. And so um, what eventually happened is he lost hope and he couldn't go back to the MDMA because he was told not to, and so he committed suicide. And his mother put this MAPS logo on his tombstone because the MDMA had helped him when he was able to do it. So that, that's what keeps me going. So it's just these stories. And then, um, you know, every once in a while I'll do MDMA or I'll, you know, do a psychedelic. And I'm like, yeah, this stuff really the works. Magic is here. <laughs> it it really still does. works. <laughs> yeah, it's still great. So that, that keeps me going. And then I think the other big thing is that I've been able to separate out um, how do I get satisfaction? And I don't get it from success so much, even though that's good, but I get it from effort. Right. So as long as I'm trying hard, I can feel happy at the end of the day. Yeah. And if it works or not, I mean, it matters if it works, but I'm not dependent on it. Because, outcome necessarily. Yeah, be because for so many years, there was no successful outcomes. Right. It was just the process of the journey and the creation and the probably even the challenge. It's very enticing to continue. Yeah, and it was also very frustrating because I had known how therapeutic MDMA was before it was criminalized. Um, and then to see it taken away. It's and then it was just like, but, but also the propaganda about MDMA was so different than the reality. You know, the propaganda from the Nationalist on Drug Abuse was you take one dose, you're going to have permanent brain damage, it's going to have major functional consequences, and therefore it should not even be researched ever. It's too dangerous. And so the reality of it just was so different from the propaganda that I felt eventually the reality would seep through the propaganda and people would see the benefit. So that was also a big factor to keep me going. And that's why you chose the FDA. That's why you chose a, even MDMA, right, from a bipartisan perspective to well, balance. Well, the, um, the bipartisan comes from the choice of the patients, not so much from the choice of the drug. So uh, there had to be kind of a strategic analysis. Uh, now, this was after MDMA was criminalized in 85. And so I'm thinking, what is the um, psychedelic that's most likely to make it through the system? And then what patient population do we marry it to? So, you know, a drug for a particular thing. And so the first part of the thought was that um, MDMA is the most gentle of the psychedelics, mm -hmm. it's the easiest to integrate, it's the least departure from your normal consciousness. And also we believe that the therapists who are gonna administer this to patients will be more effective if they've done the drug themselves. And there's a lot more resistance among psychiatrists and therapists to taking psilocybin or ayahuasca. They're more challenging sure. in ways than MDMA. 
So I thought, okay, MDMA is the one that's most likely to make it through the system. Um, and it's incredibly therapeutic and very profound, the experience. So then I had, so what's the patient population? So then we needed, um, first off, a population with patients who are sympathetic to the American public. Um, women who've been raped and sexually abused are somewhat sympathetic, um, um, but veterans even more so. Wow. You know, and so veterans have, you know, two thirds of our patients are uh, women, but the veterans get most of the media attention. Right. Um, so we also needed a disease that if it wasn't properly treated, it could lead to suicide or severe consequences. Also, a disease that cost the medical system a lot of money. Because again, the therapy is gonna be intensive and labor intensive. So we needed to offset, if the healings took place, then it would save a bunch of money for insurance companies and for the medical system. So when you have um, a stress-related Ill illness like PTSD, mm -hmm. there are so many different consequences on your body from living in this high-stressed way that people need a lot of medical care. And if you have a panic reaction, you go to emergency room. Emergency rooms are really expensive. Um, and we also needed a, a clinical condition for which the currently available treatments may have helped a bunch of people, but left a lot of people still needing help. Right. So right now, for example, there's over a million veterans getting disability payments from the VA wow. at a cost of $17 billion a year. Every year, the VA puts out $17 billion just for disability payments for PTSD, not counting their medical treatment or their therapy. Wow. And you would think that the VA noticing that would have been willing to support Support MDMA research, but no, not yet. But they are finally willing to let us do the MDMA research inside some VA facilities. And they're starting to let some VA therapists use their work time to, to work on it where we don't necessarily have to reimburse it. So MDMA for PTSD became the um, combination. And that's where I felt that um, that would be first. And as it turns out, all these years later, we're the only ones in phase three. We're done with our two phase three studies. You are the closest. I mean, you're, closest. and you're leading. You're yeah. Leading and, and I didn't fully answer your question before about what happens yeah. next. So what we need to do is um, submit all this data, together all this data to the FDA. They have a six month review process. Um, but if they ask you a question, the clock stops and then however long it takes you. So because this is a breakthrough therapy right. designated by the FDA, they, they have a shorter review time. But the, again, we'll see how many questions they have and how quickly we can respond to it. Right. We've got a lot of work to do to get all of the data necessary to submit to them. Plus we have to do other studies than just the phase three. So one of the, for example, we ask people to fast from midnight to the morning so that when they take MDMA, it's more or less on empty stomach. They can have a very light breakfast uh, but but basically think about fasting. So what the FDA wants us to do is what we call the uh, hamburger study. So it's like, uh, you know, what does the uh, bioavailability look like if you take it on a full stomach rather than an empty stomach? Gotcha. Um, it's not that important to know because we're asking people to, to more or less fast. So why do we need to know? But, but the FDA wants to know that. So we have to do that. Um, so I think that we will end up, once FDA looks at they also want an FDA advisory committee. So you have a sort of a public um, hearing and outside experts and patients and drug lawyers, whoever wants to come can come and give advice to the FDA what they think they should do. So we're going to have an FDA advisory committee meeting. Um, once the FDA says yes, if they do say yes, it's still a scheduled drug. Mm -hmm. And so the DEA has to reschedule. And in the past, the DEA doesn't like to reschedule controlled substances. So they kept uh, delaying and delaying. And so Congress passed a law, the DEA must reschedule within 90 days. Gotcha. What schedule it goes in is up to the DEA and the FDA controlled substances staff. And they kind of negotiate together. We hope it'll be schedule three or schedule four. Mm -hmm. So all of that means by, I'd say, um, early to middle 2024, we should have, if the second phase three study looks good, as we think it probably does, we should have FDA approval. Clinically available MDMA to treat PTSD. Yes, but again, unlike um, Spravato, ketamine, which you can take at home, you know, this will only be under direct supervision of a therapist, never a take-home medicine. And the therapist will require special training. Through the maps. Through the maps. Or, or we're, I mean, the long-term vision of this is that when we talk about public benefit, what is really the public benefit? It's 
treating people with PTSD. Right. So training therapists is just a means to an end. So we don't need to be the only one that does the training therapists. In fact, we want schools of psychology and psychotherapy to have psychedelic psychotherapy training programs for psychiatrists and therapists. And we also, even though, you know, in, par in large part, because we've been mostly philanthropically funded, um, we're about the healing. So we're not trying to say that MDMA is the solution for all the problems. And what we are trying to say is that it's psychedelic medicine that we really want to make legal. And so if the therapists get cross-trained to MDMA, to ketamine, to psilocybin, to 5-MeO-DMT, or, or Ibogaine, whatever comes along the road, they will then be able to customize a treatment for each individual patient. And it could involve a sequence of different drugs or, you know, so for PTSD, you could imagine the first couple of sessions MDMA, then somebody could do a psilocybin. I, I will add though that what we've learned in phase two is that the mystical experience is not correlated with therapeutic outcomes. Well, for MDMA. For MDMA, for PTSD. But it is for the psilocybin, for, for alcoholism, for, outcomes of, for OCD, for depression, for end of life related to anxiety, all these things. And the research with LSD also in the 60s with um, substance with uh, heroin addiction, alcoholism, that the LSD, it is correlated with the mystical experience, but um, MDMA is not. Th there's other benefits from the mystical experience, but not reduction of PTSD symptoms. So that influences our therapeutic method. We're not trying to steer people towards that. For sure. Yeah. So I think that we will then imagine though that you could have a couple section, sessions for MDMA, then you might want to try a, a classic psychedelic like psilocybin or whatever. Then, and then just to sort of add another complexity here, we do require people to take, taper off of their psychiatric medicines to, be, uh, in the, to volunteer to receive MDMA. The traditional psychiatric medicines for PTSD, SSRIs, they blunt the effects of MDMA. However, there have been reports from underground therapists and others that when you um, double the dose of MDMA to somebody that's on SSRIs, they have a pretty full experience, but they don't seem to get serotonin syndrome. So that was the worry why nobody's talking about that, is you think, oh my God, you double MDMA and they're already taking an SSRI, you're gonna give them serotonin syndrome, they'll overheat, they'll die or, or whatever. So what we need to do is a um, dose response safety study of people on SSRIs with PTSD and give them increasing amounts of MDMA. So this will be one of the, um, what's called phase four studies. Oh, there's a phase four. Yes, there is a phase four. Is there four. a phase five? Uh, there's no phase five. So, but uh, what phase, well, let's start it. There's preclinical, you have to do some animal toxicity studies to get into humans. Mm -hmm. Then phase one is basically um, healthy volunteers and you're trying to figure out what the drug does. Mm -hmm. So th again, most of these drugs are drugs that are invented by pharma. They don't have, they're, they're not recreational drugs. They're not used by tens of millions of people. So they don't really know what they got. Right. So phase one is understanding what it does in humans that are not patients. Phase two is you're working with patients and you're trying to figure out what's your treatment, who is this work for, who doesn't it work for, um, who do you exclude, who do you include, um, what are your doses, all this kind of stuff. Phase three is the large scale double blind placebo controlled studies that you need two of to prove safety and efficacy to get FDA to say yes. Once you do that, let's assume that you, that, let's assume our phase three studies work and FDA says yes, then phase four is where there's studies that they want you to do, but you already have permission to market the drug. So the first phase for study that we're required to do if we get approval is with adolescents with PTSD. So we are being required to work with 12 to 17 year olds with PTSD. Wow. With if, MDMA? With MDMA therapy, yes. Yeah, so if, it, now right now we're being prohibited from working with adolescents. There, um, our phase three studies currently are in Israel, Canada, and the US, and we have an 18 year age limit. Uh, so they have to be 18. There's no upper age limit because it's about your health, it's not about your age. Right. But we do have this, and we had a terrible tragic situation of this mother called about a daughter who was mute from having been sexually abused and was 16 years old and we wanted to get her in the treatment and the FDA said no. And they said only until you finish the work with adults, but then we are being required to do these adolescent studies. And if it works then, then we gotta go down to seven to 11 year olds. So 
because you've got kids that are traumatized. And just think of all these refugees that are like millions and millions of Ukrainian refugees and Syrian refugees. And, and yet you probably hear the voice in the back saying, you know, drugs, kids. Well, I think that's why I'm very interested. That's why I make a point of saying the FDA is requiring this right, yeah. because I think that, um, yeah, we, we don't think of keeping kids away from uh, medicines, vaccines, things that'll help them. Sure. Um, nor do we keep them away from um, drugs with, for attention deficit disorder when they're even really young. So, so I think this idea of um, kids' brains are developing and therefore we have to keep them free from drugs is just an um, excuse to justify the drug war. And it's to develop fears. Parents are worried about their kids. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you've got PTSD, it's changed your brain. Yeah. And so if you're an adolescent with PTSD, you should be able to have access to therapy. So that's phase. Then, then this, the um, study that will be with people on SSRIs, that'll be a, a phase four study as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the regenerative financing that you did uh, about a yes. year ago? And just yeah. as context for the listeners, right? You've been a nonprofit yeah. since 85 or 86. 86 yeah. uh, you started the Public Benefit Corporation that's fully owned by the nonprofit, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yet what has become clear is it's gonna require a significant amount of capital yeah. to ensure that this not only can get through phase three clinical trials, but that this can actually really be going yeah. to market, yeah. right? And so I'd love if you could just talk a little bit about, yeah. I mean, what it is, but also why you chose to do that. Because I imagine having established yourself as a nonprofit, yeah. And then not necessarily totally shifting, but bringing in a finance. Well, option. it was only out of um, frustration at the failure of philanthropy. So here we are at Wonderland, which is a conference for investors in for-profit psychedelic companies. So once this whole for-profit ecosystem started developing, a bunch of donors were saying, well, why should we donate? We could just invest. It became suddenly much more difficult. Also, once we started succeeding in our first phase three study, then we had other donors say, and this I disagree with, but what they said is philanthropy is only for things that you cannot fund another way. So now, since it looks like you might actually succeed, and there's, uh, even though MDMA is in the public domain, it's uh, invented by Merck in 1912. Mm -hmm. And in the late 1980s, early 90s, I hired a patent attorney for an anti-patent strategy nice. against the uses of MDMA. So not us, nobody can patent MDMA for PTSD or other things. There's a program called data exclusivity signed into law by Reagan in 84 that permits um, people who develop drugs that are off patent to have the exclusive use of their data for five years. And so what that means is that we can be a monopoly supplier. The difference from that in a patent is another company, if they wanted to generate their own data, they could do that. So I don't feel like we're stopping anybody if they want to do that. Um, the other part of it is just by the way, that if you do these pediatric studies, you get an additional six months of data exclusivity. All right, so a bunch of our uh, people who had been donating said, well, now it, you're, it looks to us like you might actually succeed. And therefore there's a revenue stream that may come in and there's 12 million PTSD patients in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, the value of treating them is substantial. We've hired the Boston Consulting Group to do analysis for us. Um, it's, it's kind of- not cheap. It's, <laughs> well, it's, it's not cheap, but it's cheaper than normal. And it's because um, there's a fellow named Dan Grossman who does uh, pharma for Boston Consulting Group. Mm -hmm. And he's friends with David Bronner. He happened to be the one that gave David Bronner LSD for David's first trip. Really? They were um, classmates at Harvard together. Oh, amazing. Okay. And so now Dan has grown up to be, you know, BCG Pharma. So they, they took the case for us. But what they said is that there's a large value from treating PTSD, particularly severe PTSD, uh, for the insurance companies, for society. So the move to the royalty finance was I basically feel it was my, my failure at philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So even though we raised 135 million in grants and donations in our history, we needed a bunch more and um, it was getting really difficult. And we did not really understand what it means to go from an approved drug to a drug that actually reaches his patients for patient So There's a whole commercial apparatus that's necessary. So, you know, BCG sort of charted that out for us. They said, we need to hire 70 more people and we need to do it two years ahead of time. And they have to do all, all different aspects to sort of prepare for the marketing. Um, 
And so what we found, Ryan Zuer, who's- um, Vine been, Ventures, right? Yeah, Vine Ventures has been terrific, actually. Um, so this was sort of a novel financing where um, we are sharing a 6.1% um, of the North American revenues from the sale of MDMA for $70 million based on all these projections and stuff. And, and, um, and there's no ownership of the benefit corp. So they, they can't tell us what to do or how to do, but we will share revenue. And, and the, the reason that it's revenue rather than income is that we're not gonna make that much income because we're gonna reinvest it. We're gonna put a patient assistant program. We're gonna do other research. So if it were based on income, it wouldn't be fair to the investors. So it's based on revenue. And we've raised about, about $50 million wow. in that. Now we're trying to raise the final 20 million in sort of a, a bridge loan okay. that would be um, convertible if we'd go, um, if we have to end up going to sell equity or something like that. But what our hope is, is to go the rest of the way with philanthropy, because we want to innovate in two different ways. One is psychedelic assisted therapy. The other is marketing a pharmaceutical drug where you maximize public benefit, not profit. But the more investors we have to take in, the more that can shift. And I'm very worried about that. I'm already seeing changes like that happening when MAPS is still the 100% owner of the Benefit Corp. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you said you talked to Hamilton about patents. Yeah. You know, there's a tendency in pharma to patent everything they can think of. Right. Um, just to slow, you know, generics onto the market. Um, we've had an open science policy and that's what our donors have wanted us to do. And that, that's why I think we've seeded the ecosystem. And now there are hundreds of for-profit companies and, you know, there's uh, USONA as another nonprofit and Hefter and um, so I hope that the nonprofits and the public benefits keep the for-profits in check. But since we are here at Wonderland, I should also say that we're in favor of for-profits. And I'm even in favor of certain kind of patents. You know, if somebody has a truly novel innovation that adds value, um, sure, go ahead and patent it. That's, yeah, you know, so that if you come, let's say Hamilton comes up with some new molecule that he says is better than MDMA, right. whatever way, he should patent it. And that'd be totally fine. Um, what I'm concerned about is overbroad patents. Patents as a strategy. Like scorched earth patents almost. Exactly, because right? uh, you can get patents, but it can take people millions of dollars to fight your patents, even if you didn't deserve to get the patents. The patent examiners are too busy sometimes. So um, yeah, there's a lot of this um, collaboration that stops happening once you start getting all these blizzard of patents about things. And so that's what we'd like to avoid. So if we can go the rest of the way, right now, what we're told is that it's about $200 million to get to what we're calling sustainability. So more or less $100 million to get to um, NDA approval, FDA approval and DEA approval. And then another $100 million or so to get to where the income from the sale of MDMA covers all of our expenses and starts to bring in more money for more research and patient assistance and things like that. So. Can we reduce that to 200 to 100? You know, maybe, but we might not be as prepared for the launch. Right. Um, and then there's a public benefit in getting this out to as many patients as possible. So we're, we're trying to balance things, but I'm very worried about the um, influence of um, private interests over public benefit. Right. And so if we were um, able to get all the rest that we need from philanthropy, one of the things that we're talking about, um, you know, you hear all the time about uh, net zero carbon, you know, so we want to have a world of net zero trauma. And how are we going to do that? So Bhutan has this national measure of happiness yeah. and other countries are using that to compare their happiness. So we want a national measure of trauma mm. and the, all different kinds of trauma and then apply it all over the world. This would be probably done in conjunction with the UN or other things. And then I'd say over the next 50 years, as psychedelics come online, and as we think there'll be six or 7,000 psychedelic clinics in America, another 6,000 in Europe, and who knows, another 10,000 or more in the rest of the world, can we over time um, reduce the burden of trauma, the burden of depression, and promote these kind of spiritual senses of connection that the world will tip from you know, causing may w way more trauma than anybody can cure every year, we're gonna have 
hundreds of millions of climate refugees. I mean, it's only going to get worse for a long time. So our goal is this net zero trauma by 2070. And I've seen you quoted as like a global spiritualized humanity. Yeah, I mean, because, uh, well, when you see the astronauts, uh, some of them talk about looking back at the Earth from space and they see it's one thing. Right. And that really impacts them a lot. So uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Ellie, um, one of her close friends in uh, grammar school and in high school had a grandfather who was Michael Collins. And he was the um, pilot on the Apollo that went to the, oh, wow. to the moon. So he orbited the moon, uh, but didn't land um, when Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong landed there. But afterwards they came back um, and they had ticker tape parades all over the world. And what Michael said was that the most striking thing to him is he said that we did this, but we didn't mean America, even though it was America. He said we was the human race. The human race made it to the moon. So it's that kind of who's the we to make the we all of us, including nature, including animals, um, and that if we can think of ourselves that way, then the human mind is so brilliant that we can have enough food for everybody, enough shelter, we can have paradise on earth if we just stop killing each other and certain people amassing way more resources and others not having enough. And so These I basic physiological sort of hierarchy of needs can be handled and taken care of and we can focus on yes. greater creation. Yeah, now it's, it's great that you mentioned this hierarchy of needs. So yeah. let me ask you a question. So, so this is from Abraham Maslow. Yeah. What do you understand is the um, hierarchy of needs? What is it at the top? Well, the, at the top, a lot of people think it's self-actualization. What in fact is above that, I believe, is self-transcendence. Yes, exactly. Great, great, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great. Yeah, yeah. So in the last few years of his life, he passed. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the last few years of his life, Abraham Maslow changed it after he learned about the LSD research and the psychedelic research to self-transcendence. And so that's where you realize, you know, whatever we accomplish is because of all the other people that have helped us to be where we are. Uh, we're not doing it by ourselves. So that's the transformation that individuals need to make and societies and humanity needs to make. And we are so far away from that right now where we see a rise of people motivated by fear, by anxiety, and that's all these- uh, Divisiveness. Divisiveness, yeah. So I think um, the destruction of the weaponry that we have, you know, Putin talking about nuclear weapons possibly going after Ukraine, you know, the climate change situations, I think only a spiritualized humanity will help us get out of these problems that we're in. But I think it's within range, and I think it's possible. I think it'll take, you know, multiple decades. Generations. Generations, a couple of generations. Yeah, actually, that's the last thing. The, um, you know, so I'm Jewish, so there's this whole question about um, the story about Moses and Passover, where the Jews leave from slavery, and, and they spend um, 40 years in the desert. Um, now, I've been to the Sinai Desert, it's not that big. I mean, it's big, but you can cross it in, in less than 40 years. So why did it take them 40 years? So the, the sort of religious spiritual answer is that they wanted a whole generation to die out. The generation that had been born into slavery, they wanted them to die. And so it would be a generation that was born into freedom that would then start the promised land. And that, that's why it took so long. So I, I think we will need multiple generations to, to get over this kind of divisiveness and then the, the healed generation and then we'll have more spiritualized humanity. So that's why 50 years from now, I say roughly 2070. Ken Wilber, he wrote this book called The Religion of Tomorrow. And he talked about how when the printing press was invented, mm -hmm. it wasn't that every single person had to learn how to read. It was that 10% of the population mm -hmm. could reach literacy and they would create the academic and university system yeah. that would then enable literacy mm -hmm. for everyone. And I think it's similar with, let's say, the frame that I've always taken with psychedelics, accelerating, let's say, the evolution of consciousness or the, mm -hmm. the, the sort of perspective to see yeah. new perspectives. Yeah. It's not that every single person has to do psychedelics. It's that if it's five to 10% of people yeah. who yeah. have this awareness of interconnectedness, mm -hmm. then what new systems will they then be, yeah. regenerative systems will they want to create and, and how could those regenerative systems create generations of, let's say, harmonious interbeing with everything yeah. around us, if yeah. you will. And it sounds very yeah. utopian, but it also yeah. 
there's all, in, in, in human culture and human civilization, there's always new utopias. Yeah. And I feel like that is the next one. Yeah. And, and I, I'll say that I've been very influenced by Aldous Huxley and the book Island, mm -hmm. if you know. So that was about the creation of a psychedelic utopia on this island. And that was where they actually had the initiation of the young uh, with psychedelics at Rites, Rites of, of Passage. passage. Um, but as he was writing this book, Aldous Huxley um, changed his mind about it and the book ends with the oil companies come to this island and destroy it in order for the oil so it's similar to the movie avatar that a lot of people have seen mm -hmm. um, so what the meaning for that for me is that in an era of global warming of um, nuclear weapons there's no private utopia you know so when michael midhover came to me our, our lead psychiatrist in 2000 and i'd never met him before and he said i want to work with you on creating an offshore clinic. Because he had just come back from um, St. Kitts where this woman, Deborah Mash, had had an eye Yeah, we had her on the podcast as well. Yeah, and so Michael had a patient that was addicted to opiates and wanted to try Ibogaine. And Michael said he would be okay with that, but only if he could go and watch and see what happened. So Michael saw this healing at St. Kitts and then he came back and then we were at the world's first ayahuasca conference organized by Ralph Metzner in 2000. In San, was in San Francisco. Okay. And, um, and Michael came up to me and he said that he um, was a member of MAPS. He'd studied with Stan Groff and the whole trip of breath work and he wanted to work with me on an offshore clinic. And I basically said, there are no private utopias. I'm not interested in that at all. What I want to do is go to the heart of the system and change from the inside out. And that means going through the FDA. And when I explained that to Michael, within 10 minutes, he's like, okay, I'm an expert in PTSD. I'm great. We want MDMA for PTSD. And so- You sold him. You got him on board. And we, yes. And I've just, you know, talked to him today and yesterday and all these years. So I think that um, there are no private utopias and we have never been capable of destroying the planet in the ways that we are now. Right. And the species extinction, or we've never been capable of destroying each other. So all this, like Elon Musk and others, they, uh, let's go to Mars or Jeff Bezos, you know, it's like you're bringing the same consciousness there. What are you really accomplishing? Right. Nothing uh, other than all this money that should be going to mental health for the people on Earth right And now. restoring the Earth and, and taking care of communities and reinvesting in, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's something idealistic about, yeah, we are, we, we are cosmic and to help us think about it in more cosmic terms. So there, there's a lot good to that, but I think um, the, the utopia we have to build, and we also have to build it for everybody. I'll say that I had this um, two days of, um, one was uh, a DMT experience, the next day was ketamine. Yeah. This is, you know, but this is where my political philosophy began. Yeah. There, no, it, was, it was sort of strengthened. This was 1985. So the, this was with um, you know, Terrence McKenna and, and Andy Well and uh, Ralph Metz and others, a bunch of us sitting around in a circle doing uh, DMT. Amazing. I had never done DMT before. So during this DMT experience, um, you know, I was like blasted and, and I was just thinking, great, this is wonderful. You know, I'm part of everything. Everything's part of me. And, and then I thought in my innermost spot, which is sort of my mind where I'm talking to myself, well, I'm talking to myself in English. I didn't invent English. I mean, millions of people thought, you know, long time. So all of this, even in my innermost private spot, it's not really me. It, it's this whole communal self. production, this bigger self. Mm -hmm. And so then I thought, wow, this is wonderful, beautiful. And then I had this honest idea, which is if everything's part of you and you're part of everything, then Hitler is part of you too. So he's like the big demon. And, and so to realize that I have my own inner Hitler, that, that he's actually part of me, it's not just out there. That was like a shattering thing. The very next day, it, it took me a day to really, you know, I mean, I was very affected on that. And so this was a group of us at Esalen trying to figure out how to keep MDMA legal and stuff. So, so we're also experimenting. Yeah. So the next day we were um, doing ketamine. Uh -huh. So in the ketamine trip, I'm hovering above and behind uh, Hitler giving a speech. Hmm. And I'm sort of thinking, I got to get into his head. I got to get into his head. How do I, you know, make him not want to kill all these people or, or how do you do it? And, and then I saw this Heil Hitler salute thing in his speeches. And when it felt to me like he would do the salute and then everybody would do it back to him. Mm -hmm. So it felt like the many giving the power to the one and then the one pushing it back and the many giving it back. And it was like this vibration. Mm -hmm. And I, I kept realizing that if, um, if I couldn't watch this, if I panicked, I would not ever 
be able to do any good. And I realized that one of the beautiful things about ketamine is that you can breathe and you can, it doesn't affect your respiration. So I breathed and I was able to quiet my fear. But then I realized that there was no way I could get into his head. That, you know, th this idea that people have to want to change. Right. You, you can't just make them change. But I realized, look at all these, the mass of people that are giving their power to him. They're not getting as much out of it. They're surrendering. They're not really gaining. So the ultimate solution has to be not giving MDMA to Hitler or Trump or, or like this. It has to be grounded in mass mental health. And so that's where the, the twofold strategy has come. One is um, drug development, the other drug policy reform so that it's available to people who don't necessarily have a diagnosis and who don't feel like they wanna go in a religious context or a medical context. But all of that is to say, I do think that we need to lodge a new kind of consciousness in humanity. And I think it's um, coming. You could say even one of the um, amazing um, upsides of COVID was it just helped us realize how interconnected we are. I mean, it, the whole world was impacted by this. And there was no in. escaping it. There's no escaping it. So, you know, so, you know, you can have mega billionaires like I'll, I'll go to Mars or I'll, but, but, you know, it's got to be We're still all one. Here. Yeah. You know. And I think to speak to that, one word that comes up, willful participation, right? There has to be a desire yeah. to want and then agency, right? Yeah. And, a, and yeah. a feeling like, oh, I am responsible for, yeah. and then wanting to make those changes. And it's not just the drug yeah. necessarily, it is the combination of that empowerment with- Well, I'd say the drug is um, the catalyst, but it's the human relationship that, or the therapy that makes it worthwhile. But, but also when I talk about drug legalization, people can do a lot of their own healing without therapists. I mean, when you get stuck, there's a lot of people that need um, support. But I think um, once we move into a post-prohibition world, there can be a lot of uh, preventative psychedelic medical use. You know, as you maybe have a crisis, and, but you're not down into depression and you work, work through it, or an early trauma that you work through so it doesn't become post-traumatic stress disorder it doesn't have a chance to stick yeah. necessarily yeah and rewire well i want to thank you oh. for coming on yeah. the the podcast for joining us you are a uh, uh, yeah oh, oh well i didn't realize you were about to wrap up so there was something okay. else okay, i wanted it. to Go say you are, you are welcome to speak as much as you want <laughs> okay um well i just wanted to say that um we are going to be having the world's largest psychedelic conference ever yeah and it's in june in uh, 2023 in Denver. So I'd like to, you know, people can do a psychedelicscience.org and can find out about it. But what's also going to be very interesting, it's in Denver. And um, next week, uh, I don't know if that screws things up in terms of time, but I'm saying the, the November election. Yeah, um, for Colorado. For America. But in Colorado, there's a natural plant medicine. Prop 122. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if that passes, um, it sort of demonstrates that the citizens of Colorado are comfortable with plant medicines. So for the conference, what we want to do is have the first couple of days to be experiential. Nice. And then the rest are listening to lectures and doing things. So um, we want to have, so Stan Groff is coming with Amazing. Brigitte to do holotropic breath work. The people from Naropa are going to do a meditation retreat. We're going to have people come to do a rape, which is kind of a nicotine. Um, tobacco snuff. Tobacco snuff. Yeah. We'll have that. We'll have, um, all different kinds of experiential opportunities for people. Um, we can do Santo Daime, which is federally legal. So we will have a lot of federally legal researchers and there'll be a little Ayahuasca bit- Ayahuasca with Rick Doblin, is that- is Well, that um, I'm kind of allergic to uh, religious contexts, I would say. So um, I probably wouldn't go to the, the Santo, Santo Daime. Daime. I've been to a bunch of Santo Daime. I, uh, I have nothing against that. <laughs> I, I, I like, it's I like, not your style so much. It, it, I don't enjoy it as much. Yeah. You know, I've been to the UDV mm -hmm. as well, ceremonies. But my favorite ayahuasca ceremony was actually in Brazil, but it was at a retreat where um, uh, Jonathan Ott and I were speakers. Um, and it was done in a therapeutic context. I felt that that was the most open for me to go wherever I wanted to do. So that, that's my preferred, yeah. Yeah, so I won't be probably in those ayahuasca ceremonies, but, but I wanted to invite people to come yeah. and think about the conference, a lot of networking, and, and the mayor is, of Denver is gonna open it up for us. 
We got support from the governor. We're actually, Denver was the first city to um, make mushrooms the lowest enforcement priority. And the police are interested and we're trying to work on an educational program for the Denver police of how to de-escalate if they find somebody having a difficult psychedelic trip. Mm. So I think the conference will be a good blend and of uh, experiential with uh, academic, you could say, and a lot of networking and parties and socialization and all of that. And so the theme of it is the doorway to a new world. So we think good. by then we will have gotten the application to the FDA mm -hmm. right around that time or almost you know, around that time, or it'll be almost ready or fully ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, the phase three studies will have started with psilocybin. And so it'll be on the theme of this doorway to the new world. I love that. And we will be there. Third wave. I'll be there. Right. We're going to do an activation. We'll probably, we're sponsoring, you know, we'll. Yeah. So it's great to do many activations and you're expecting almost 10,000 people, yeah. I think, at the yeah. convention. Yeah, center, yeah right? we have so, the, um, it's a bargain actually, because when we um, took the gamble, we have got a bunch of hotel rooms that we had to guarantee, but now because of inflation and stuff, they're, they're a good deal. <laughs> And there's one thing, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but there's a bunch of dorms that are near the convention center and the school will be out and mm -hmm. it's a state school. And so we're trying to get access to all these dorms oh, wow. so uh, students can have low cost housing. Amazing. That's what we're trying to do Amazing. as well because it's pretty expensive to go to these hotels. <laughs> any, any final things before? Well, well, I guess I'd be curious if you could tell me a little bit about what your longer term plans are. Oh, I, I love this, Rick. So, you know, my approach has always been non-clinical, non-medical, right? In terms of looking at how psychedelics can not only help heal, yeah. but the betterment of the well, yeah. right? And so really looking at what I call the skill of psychedelics. How can we combine microdosing with higher dosing with non-psychedelic modalities yeah. to facilitate growth, transformation, the evolution of consciousness? And so the frame that I've often taken is you know, I love history. So, mm. you know, what have we learned from the first wave and the second wave, indigenous yeah. use and the counterculture yeah. that can be applicable to this third wave mm -hmm. of psychedelics? Yeah. So both cutting edge science, mm -hmm. methodology, but also ancient ritual. Mm -hmm. And then how do we find sort of like, like I love Taoism, mm -hmm. the middle way yeah. between those two to facilitate cultural integration of psychedelics. My sense is that decentralization is really the future mm -hmm. and that the work that you've done mm -hmm. through MAPS and the FDA is incredibly necessary and has been yeah. a huge yeah. block or a huge, um, it's cleared a lot of, mm -hmm. cleared a lot of way. Yeah. And what that's created space for is Oregon, Colorado, yeah. Yeah. decriminalization across yeah. the board. And so my sense is we'll see this beautiful symphony of those three yeah. that pretty soon will allow for, for full access. And so what I feel like is necessary within that is it does have to be both and, clinical and non-clinical, medical yeah. and non-medical. And, and that the, one of the biggest sort of problems, so to say, is as this grows, how do we find um, qualified and trustworthy guides, facilitators, and shamans? Yes, yes. And so I really think there's an opportunity with technology to help bridge that gap to help people find a qualified guide or therapist mm -hmm. or clinic or retreat center. Um, and then my personal love, like the tech stuff is nice, but my personal love is teaching and oh, education. Oh, nice. And so That's I'm really nice. interested in how business can be a force for good. Uh -huh. And so we're doing trainings now for executive coaches and wellness coaches and peak performance mm -hmm. coaches. Um, and really looking at, okay, if you're gonna work with the leaders of tomorrow, mm -hmm. how can you transform their consciousness through psychedelics so they recognize yeah this sense of interconnectedness, and they then build business and healthcare and politic mm. around that, mm -hmm. that yeah. concept. Oh, that's great. And, and you've reminded me that there's one big part of what we do, which I haven't talked about, which yeah. is our Zendo project. So it's psychedelic harm reduction. So in order to build this post-prohibition world that you're talking about, that I'm talking about, there will be a lot of people that try psychedelics without therapists, and some fraction of them will get into trouble meaning it'll be difficult material, they won't know what to do. Um, it, if they get really panicked, they could um, end up at an emergency room, they could get tranquilized, they could get diagnosed, it could be a downhill slope. So in order to really make a post-prohibition world work out well, what we need is honest drug education, pure drugs, um, treatment on demand for people to get problems, but also pure support. So what we need to do is really train large numbers of people to um, help others that are having a difficult trip and to understand that these drugs, which they may think of just as party drugs, and then when something difficult comes up, if you think about it as a party drug, 
then that means, oh, you're going downhill, it's going to be, quote, a bad trip. And we like to say that difficult is not the same as bad. What makes it bad is resistance. So I think the peer support is going to be critical. And, and eventually it should be taught in schools instead of dare. <laughs> Kind of thing. It's like a listening society. How do we teach the skill of listening, of holding space, of being present, of being with? Yeah, and it applies beyond just psychedelics. I mean, it's just about how do you help people? Like the, the stresses of the world with climate change, with um, they're just going to increase. And so we need to help people deal with stress. And even our goal with therapy is to help people deal with their traumas without the use of drugs. It, we only give them a few times to get to the core of the problem, but to teach them the skills that then they can work as they get exposed to further traumas on their own. So I, it can I be self-resourced in that way. Right? Very much so. Yeah. So this has been great. This is a yeah. fun conversation. Could, yeah. We could go for hours. We could. Yeah. We definitely could. Let's go, go, we go, could. go. Yeah, that, that is the beautiful of podcasts if you have time to go off on yeah. these tangents. Yeah. And have you been on Joe Rogan? Yeah, yeah. three times. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So what I'm particularly... Um, proud of is that on Joe Rogan, the, the first couple times I did it is he was in California. The third time I did it, he was in Texas. But the first two times he passed around a joint. Yeah. And so I smoke more pot than Joe Rogan did for four <laughs> times. So it's kind of a silly You held thing. it down. I held it down. Yeah, it you good. held it down. I was, I was particularly proud. That's so great. <laughs> well, Rick, I want to I wanna thank you for 40 years of incredible yeah. work, yeah. for pioneering this entire space yeah. around psychedelics, for listening for your humility for your yeah. capacity it really um it's an honor to sit here with you it's an honor yeah. to interview you and thank i'm just you. appreciative of yeah all of the energy and, and, time. and i'd like to thank you because i think the public education piece of what we need to do is is absolutely essential because we can make progress with the research but we also need to really make progress with the public education to get people ready for this. Absolutely, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a, it takes a global citizenry, right? Yeah. It's a yeah. global community. Yeah, and this is like again, as I started talking about the difference between individual change and cultural change. Right. You know, it takes a lot of information seeding big parts of the culture. But I think you're also right about the earlier part where you're saying that. Um, you don't need everybody. If you can get a leading edge, they can then set the tone. And I, I got others. this from Terrence McKenna as well. He was, yeah. uh, Ralph Metzner asked him this question at Esalen, does everyone need to do psychedelics? And Terrence was like, I think only probably five to 10% of people can handle yeah. the ego death and the deep things that happen with that. I don't know about that. I mean, I think with the proper support, yeah. I think more people could. Yeah. You know, and, and actually Stan Groff talked, talked about it when they were doing the work with LSD with uh, alcohol use. He said that, you know, there was some people that, that thought that this is only for the highly educated people. But he had like this skid row bum that was totally um, overdoing alcohol. But in LSD, he had a spiritual experience. He, he didn't have the vocabulary for it, mm -hmm. but he was able to have that experience and that helped him get better from the alcohol. So I think a lot of, more than 10%, I think, can handle it. But you need um, to build up to it. You need proper support, proper integration afterwards. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ray. Wow. Thank you wow. again. Great. This is so My fun. pleasure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit the thethirdwave.co, where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.